Um, I was approached, uh, recently we've had a couple of new publishing houses launching in, in Bangladesh. One is called The Daily Star, which is affiliated with The Daily Star newspaper. It's the largest circulation English language paper in Bangladesh. And I've been a columnist of theirs actually for almost 15 years for their weekend magazine. So I have been working on a collection of short stories of my own, a manuscript for a while now, but thanks to lifelines and actually having to earn a living in between everything else, I haven't been able to give it the attention I would like to. Um, I've sent individual stories out, so I've now been published in um, eight countries, actually. The US, UK, Canada, uh, Nepal, Singapore, India, Bangladesh, and France. So, I mean, that, that part has been very good, but uh, it's quite, you know, as a short story writer, it's difficult to be taken seriously unless you have a book out of your own short stories, and that I haven't had. So, Daily Star approached me. We have the Hay Festival Dhaka coming up. We've had, this will be the third year of this festival. It's affiliated with the Hay Festival in the UK. And they said that they would like to bring out a collection um, and hopefully launch it at the Hay Festival. So it's been a tremendously hurried journey in that sense. Luckily, I had six full short stories ready. They've already, some of them have been multiply published already. And six pieces of flash fiction. Because I had, um, in 2010, I had a, one of my stories was highly commended in the Commonwealth short story competition. And that story along with um, five other pieces. So when I return from this trip, uh, hopefully we will be able to uh, finalize that manuscript. Uh, they're working on the cover. They've been sending me the proofs. It, so far it looks very nice. And this, the working title for the collection is Fragments of River Song, because you know the rivers are a very big part of our heritage. And what I wanted to say essentially is that, again, a, a little bit like Lifelines, these, these stories and pieces of writing tell uh, part of a bigger picture of where Bangladesh is now. There are actually two, two fragments in this uh, collection which are about 1971. So one is about a young man who returns to his village after the war, and the other one is about a little girl who uh, travels with her family to London as refugees during the war. And uh, so that does come through, as you were saying earlier, you know, this is very much part of a, uh, a live part of history for us still. But I'm very excited about the, at the prospect of having this book out. There isn't, a, I did think about that, there isn't a strong focus on rivers specifically. It was more that, you know, part of a very strong cultural metaphor is these bhatiyalis, you know, the, the, the songs that the, the, the boatmen sing. And so I think it's more that I would like to use that as a metaphor for storytelling here. You know, they're, they're partial and they are, they're coming from various directions towards us. But there is no strong river theme as such. What there is, is there is some uh, focus on Bangladesh outside of the cities. Again, there is, a, there is one story in particular. It's called the Mosquito Net Confessions. And it's about a young woman who goes to work for a development organization. You may have heard of it, called the Grameen Bank. And she takes a group of people out on this field trip for two weeks. And um, you know, she's, she's very nervous because she's in an alien environment and it's how she's going to deal with it. And, how to be taken seriously as a you know twenty something young woman in a in a uh, rural environment with colleagues who are not used to someone from the city, and she ends up uh, becoming very good friends with one of the interpreters in the team because she's taking out a team of French speakers. So they actually have to do she has to do translation from Bangla to English. This other girl has to do translation from English to French, but she has never lived in Bangladesh. She's an expatriate Bangladeshi who speaks no Bangla. And then they have three Africans with them who speak no English. So you can imagine, this is quite a motley crew. And the story is relatively humorous, I think. But um, what she discovers is that at night, because of the, the amount of bugs, because of the season, they sit in the darkness under the mosquito net and they have these conversations when it, they really get to know each other much better because it's much less scary in the dark to to talk about personal things. So what I wanted to do with this one is actually, again, some of the themes are, I think there's been a lot of writing up from diaspora South Asian writers, you know, and a lot of it is very interesting, but I wanted not to do a diaspora focus here. There are one or two stories which, which deal with that, but the majority of stories are very much set in Bangladesh, whether it's rural Bangladesh or, or in um, Dhaka or Chittagong. Well, as I said, this is still a working title. So I haven't finally decided on it, but I think, I think it's more just, you know, I think it's more of an overall thing because what I'm trying to, trying to put across through this collection is that we are in many ways a society in transition. You know, you have a very traditional, uh, I would say still, culture as you have in much of India. And 
Against that, you have, for example, the telecommunications revolution. We have, a, you know, the mobile phone uh, coverage in Bangladesh is phenomenal. You know, everyone, it feels like everyone has a mobile phone. Most younger people have two or three. I have no idea how they do. They, you know, they will say, oh, I have four SIMs. I will use my Roby SIM today because they have a special offer on something, you know. So it's interesting and, and, and it permeates every aspect of life. So you actually have tradesmen in the bazaar who will use their mobile phone to find out what the prices are so that they can price accordingly and they don't get cheated, um, and so on. And you have some less savory kind of modern uh, developments as a result of this, including pornography applications, text and pictures in, in Bangla. So, you know, I mean, if you, if you transpose that against, uh, you know, the more traditional society, I think it's a, it's a very uncomfortable juxtaposition in a way. So the Bhati Ali for me is just drawing on, you know, the more kind of traditional rural uh, metaphors and, and what you think of as Bangladesh, but using that to tell a story which is much more modern and complex and sometimes uncomfortable. Now, it's interesting, when I first heard about flash fiction myself a few years ago, I thought it was ridiculous. You know, I mean, I think the technical definition is supposed to be stories of 1,000 words or under, or at a push 1,500 words or under. And the idea of trying to tell any kind of story in that kind of word count was, I tend to write quite long short stories. So it was completely absurd to me. And I thought, I will never even attempt this. I'm not going to read it and I'm not going to write it. And then uh, the writers group that I'm involved with in Bangladesh, it's called Writers Block. Um, they, someone there came and told us about the Commonwealth short story competition. That was 2010. And the theme that year was, um, science, technology, and society, and you had to write a short story in 600 words. I mean, from what I've said already, I'm sure you will gather just how excited I was at this prospect, but we were going to do this exercise, and I thought about it. I thought I know nothing about science. I know nothing about technology, so I'll just focus on society. You know, that's, I can just about do that. And somehow the idea that came to me was of, um, of you know, how might the institution of marriage change in the future? because of science or technology. And I ended up writing what in some ways is actually a science fiction story about a woman who is a very successful scientist and, uh, and marries very late in life and then discovers that her husband has decided to replace her with a humanoid robot. And the story is called Judgment Day because it's a very short, you know, 600 words. So I wrote the 600 word version and that was the one that got awarded in the Commonwealth competition. And then I, you know, I had this character and the story in my mind. So I then expanded it to probably around 1200 words. So the version of this story, which is renamed The Assessment, that appears in, um, in Fragments of River Song, is a slightly longer version of it, but it still fits the criteria of less than 1500. So I have one story like that. Then I have another story which is um, the two, in fact, that I mentioned to you about 1971, both of those are flash fiction. The young man who comes back to his village and the little girl who goes as a refugee to London. Then there is a, a fourth one which is uh, told in a teenage voice in, in, of a Bangladeshi girl in high school uh, in the US, or rather an American Bangladeshi girl in high school in the US. And, um, and really, again, what my aim was actually with this collection, there, is some, there are some stories in it which are very much literary fiction in that sense. I, I've been told that my style is literary fiction, but what I wanted to do was to make this collection as engaging as possible. So there's quite a lot of range, you know, there are a lot of different voices, there are a lot of different circumstances, and in fact in one story it's called Waiting. Uh, there are three, three, it's told from the perspective of three sets of characters whose life intersect for a very brief moment. One is a young, uh, a young boy, 12 or 13, who, who lives in a slum with his family, and when he can, he does sort of errands for the market traders. And when there is no work, he has to beg with his sister, which he hates to do. So there's him. Then there is a teenage girl. And there is a teenage middle class girl. And then there is a woman whose husband is, you know, this is a phenomenon well known in India as well, has made an obscene amount of money from some business uh, ventures and wants to make sure that everyone understands how much money she has. So these three characters meet. And it's set during Ramadan. So... Um, you know, it, it brings up also some of those questions about how we observe things and, uh, you know, what, what it really means. How much of, for example, festival expenditures here also are done for show, 
and how much are done for deeper reasons, in a way. So these three characters, uh, you know, they meet at one point in the story, and it's a, just a very brief meeting, but it has an effect on all of their lives. And what I liked about that story was I felt that I tried to, I hope I succeeded, I tried to tell a story from different stratas of society in one, uh, you know, in one instance. So those are some of the, the aspects that I tried to cover with the, the collection. You know, I think this will not go down with people who feel very strongly about the purity of identity, but I think identity is a little bit like language. It does, um, it develops and adapts because of circumstance. So I would like to think that, um, you know, we will retain some of what you might consider our identities of origin, our sort of ancestral identities. And we will have to adapt somewhat to where we live and what the, what the prevailing norms and cultures are there. You know, you can, if you decide that you want to go and live in, let's say, central, you know, uh, Western Europe, you may have very strong views on how women should dress or certain things. These are not transferable. What is, what is, you know, what is acceptable in your society of origin may well not be acceptable somewhere else. So I think then you make that choice and particularly for your children. I mean, I have met so many uh, second generation immigrants and that is such a, with such issues about their identity. You know, either it's a, what I would call an almost unhealthy kind of desire to hold on to the old ways and, and stand out by doing that. You know, I mean, make yourself alien to others around you, which is, I think, perhaps not the best way to um, persuade anyone that your culture of origin is an attractive one because they just think that you're behaving strangely. Um, or to just reject it completely and say, you know, I am not Indian, I am American, or I am not Bangladeshi, I am British. And you can do that, of course, but I personally, I believe that, you know, where we come from is always part of who we are. And we are better off understanding, perhaps, and this is, a, a, you know, quite a painful and, and detailed process of understanding what we want to take from that origin culture. There is almost always quite a lot worth taking, whether it's literature or music or, you know, you don't have to subscribe to every conservative thought or idea in order to still say, I'm Bengali or I have a Bengali identity. You may be in Delhi, you may even within India, you know, you may be very far from Bengal. And I found that even, uh, you know, when I'm in, in, in uh, India and I'm around Bengalis, inevitably we end up speaking in Bangla because there is, an, there is a sense of connection that comes from that, you know. So I think, um, I think you need to, in, in the final analysis, I think you need to sort out what are your priorities. Is it language? Is it culture? Is it some aspect of music or literature or... Uh, celebration or religion or whatever it is, you know, what is really important to you? And then make an effort to be knowledgeable about that aspect of your identity and to practice it and to share it with others in a positive way. And, you know, the rest of it is, you know, going to be, require some adjustment from all of us as long as we live in the 21st century in, a, in an increasingly homogenized global world.